I know the latest M3 iPad Pro is around the corner, but I think there's plenty of good reasons to ignore that for now, especially if you want to save a bit of money. I'm Alex and I do down to earth tech videos. Have we got to 100,000 yet? No? How close are we? This here is the M2 iPad Pro and still going strong, kinda. Off the bat, you should know that I love tech gadgets, but I wouldn't call myself a pro user when it comes to using the iPad. And here are some close-up shots so you can see exactly how the iPad Pro and the Magic Keyboard held up after 18 months. The battery on the iPad has degraded a little bit, but more on that later. There are some people out there who really squeeze a lot of juice out of their iPad Pros and use this as a, almost as a smaller Mac. As you can see here by my storage usage and my most used apps, I'm not that guy. In fact, when I need to be productive with a tablet, I actually use my Tab S9 Ultra, but that's another video. Fun fact, yes, if you're wondering, I am an Android user when it comes to my main smartphone right now, but I found a way to have both Apple and Android devices kind of living in harmony here. I do use the iPad Pro, but I'd love to be able to use it a bit more for my work, and it ultimately comes down to some limitations that we've got here. More on the software side of things, to be fair, but these limitations make it harder for me to use the iPad Pro for work, and I'll show you some examples of that throughout this video. At times, it may sound like I'm being negative towards the iPad. I'm not. I've just given up on hoping that Apple would make the iPad something more powerful, especially from a productivity perspective. And maybe that's finally coming now in June at WWDC. We shall see. That was good, right? No? Okay. The reality is the M2 iPad Pro came out in October 2022, but even now, 18 months later, it still has more power than most people would need. In fact, I'd go as far as saying that what the new iPad Pro really needs is not more performance on the chip, it's not a new chip at all, but a much more capable software. Of course, this video is about my experience after 18 months, but I'll also show you why I think that for the right use case, this could be a much better purchase than the new iPad Pro. Because if you ignore the marketing hype and the YouTube hype as well, right? Since the M1 iPad Pro, Apple made the iPad as powerful as a computer, right? That is actually a fact. These new processors on the iPad Pro have the same power as the MacBook Air. And you could, if you're silly enough like me, get an iPad Pro with even 16 gig of memory and then use that for watching Netflix and play Fruit Ninja at the same time, right? I'm kind of joking here, but when I asked you in my community, most of you are on the same boat. Nearly 60% of iPad Pro users, according to this highly scientific survey here, they just like the iPad Pro for what it is. And I gotta be honest, sometimes it is just nice to have the latest and greatest, you know, the higher specs from a longevity perspective, even when you don't need all that extra power straight away. You might not even use high performance pro apps in your day to day. So I respect and I understand that from a longevity perspective. As much as I complain sometimes about Apple nerfing the iPad Pro, I am a sucker for new tech and I do want to try you know, the new OLED display as well, but that doesn't mean we need to overspend when getting a new iPad. I did an entire video on you know, how to be careful when specking your iPad app so you don't make the same mistakes I made and, and end up overspending. But one of the things that I discussed in that video was the fact that iPads last a long time. And despite the fact that Apple will make us feel like we need the latest and greatest, the previous models will do more than just fine. Let me show you what I mean. As I said in the intro, the battery has degraded a little bit, but for my usage, it's still absolutely fine. I never really got to the 10 hours of battery that Apple promises, but right now it's probably more like five to six hours when I'm really busy. And as you can see here by the cycle numbers, I don't really use the iPad that much. There are occasions when I travel and I use the iPad over a number of days, maybe two, three days. And in those scenarios, I do have to top the battery up, of course. During those work trips is when I need to use something like a portable charger, like this one here. This is the P-Series from CookTech, who are sponsoring today's video. How was that for a segue? That was pretty smooth, no? Okay, crack on, fine. If you're after an affordable, compact, but very powerful power bank, this is a fantastic option. Despite it being the size of a chocolate bar, right? It packs 10,000 milliamp, 150 watt battery with a USB-C port that you can use to charge the iPad or any USB-C type device. It will even charge big laptops up to 100 watts and supports fast charging as well on Samsung Galaxy, for example, and it charges the iPhone up to 27 watts. I'll throw some useful data here on the screen, but the three main callouts about this product for me are the speed at which it charges my devices, the weight, 287 grams, is super light, and the size. What about the price? Well, that too. I didn't buy this one, but this is about 60 to 70% cheaper than the competition. At only $49, this is incredible value really. Without compromising on quality, of course. This makes the P-Series super convenient. You can chuck this in your bag and you won't even notice it's there, it's that light. They do have bigger ones as well, which look fantastic and maybe an even better option for longer trips. I love the fact that it has a screen display as well, letting you know exactly how much time you have left to recharge or to charge your device as well. Just last week on a work trip, true story, one of my phones was dying and in less than half an hour, 
I had plenty of battery back on the phone, you know, to take me to the rest of the day without issues. Super easy to charge itself through the same port. And to give you an idea, a single charge lets me charge my S24 Ultra, fully charge it, and still have some juice left for another half charge at the end of that. As well as the link in the QR code over here, I'll leave a link to the test data here so you can see the different models and how fast they charge the iPad, the iPhone, and portable consoles as well, like the Nintendo Switch and so many other devices in there. And thanks so much, CookTech, for making this video possible. Going back to the display on the iPad Pro, I know I have a screen protector on mine here. Shout out to Paperlike, lovely stuff. I need a replacement protector anyway, so I'll show you here what the display looks Looks like after 18 months without a protector so you can see if there's any scratches and marks and for full transparency see what I did there with transparency protector there no? I've been using the screen protector on the iPad for maybe the last six months. So for about a whole year, I didn't use a protector with it. But even with the paper light protector, as you can see here, the display is awesome for those chilled content watching sessions or gaming sessions, whether you're at home or on the commute, you know, really, really nice. The iPad Pro gets a lot of views when it comes to tablety things. What I mean by that, and it's kind of obvious, but what any tablet display is great at is having enough space to do things that you can't really do on your smartphone that well. More on the Pro apps in a bit, but why did I opt for the 11 inch display this time? Actually, before I forget, if you are enjoying this video, a like goes a long way. If you're new here, your like and your subscription may actually take us over 100,000 subscribers, which is, I can't even believe I'm saying this. You know, it's been a journey, four years almost. So thank you. Even if we don't get to 100,000 in this video, thank you so much for all the support so far. And if you're new here, welcome. Got a little bit emotional there. Almost, almost. <laughs> I'm not even, yeah, never mind. Why the 11 inch? Well, I had the mini LED M1 iPad Pro, the 12.9 inch, but I ended up selling that because I realized that, sure, the display was even better, brighter, more contrasted than the M2 iPad Pro here, but I wasn't really making the most of that bigger display because I had the Galaxy Tab at the time, the S8 Ultra, which had an even bigger screen, and to be honest, a much better aspect ratio, in my opinion, for watching content. But there's a lot to be said about this form factor here, the smaller size with the Magic Keyboard. This is key, right? Because you can now sit on the couch and you can be a little bit more comfortable. The Tab S8 Ultra and the S9 Ultra, which I've got now, they're not that easy to, to just use on the couch, you know, they're quite big. So my thinking was to keep the smaller iPad Pro for tablety things, but the occasional Pro app testing like Logic Pro, Final Cut Pro, and sell the bigger 12.9 inch iPad until such a time when the iPad Pro can truly fit into my workflow from a productivity perspective. Which brings me to the software and the performance on the iPad Pro. iPadOS 17 is for me what iPadOS 16 should have been. It's a massive improvement. It annoys me a little bit that it took this long for Apple to give us some multitasking on the iPad with a little bit of flexibility in there, but at least we have it now. And depending on the apps, you can definitely multitask on the iPad now, which was impossible two years ago. The other sort of unsung hero of iPadOS 17 is the fact that you can connect the iPad to an external display now. Check this out. This is me connecting the M1 iPad Pro to an external 4K monitor. Did you just notice how quick that was? And here you can see I'm disconnecting from that monitor and connecting to a completely different monitor and a different resolution and aspect ratio. And it just works without any problems. I mean, that's really impressive. And I don't know what else I can throw at this to make it break. But. I was just thinking, there's no way this is gonna work on an 8K display, right? <laughs> Holy sh... Resizing windows doesn't feel restrictive anymore. I'm still not 100% happy with the grouping of apps and the stage manager UI, but I can totally live with that now. The young ones among you won't know this, but we've waited what it feels like a decade to get this on the iPad. It's just crazy. And I can hear you thinking, just get a laptop, bro. You know, you don't need an iPad if you just wanna connect to a monitor. And I do see your point. But when you spend so much money on a device like this, right, it's over a thousand dollars, a thousand pounds. For me, I think it's nice to be able to do things like that. And you know, it's a question of feeling like we're getting value for money. We can now connect an external camera to the iPad as well, which is great too, because obviously the camera position on the iPad isn't great, that's changing. But the fact that you can connect a professional camera to the iPad now, or even like a webcam, is great, it does make it even more powerful. You can now start to use it as a desktop if you want to. Apple has taken a long time, but it finally feels like we're getting there with the software. We still need a better file management app and a calculator, but hey, you know, we can dream, right? There's been some new features on this new iPad as well that I haven't really paid too much attention to, like the pencil hover, but I guess, you know, this will be more useful for people who are artists perhaps, or people using, you know, working on 3D models. And when it comes to talking about performance on the iPad Pro, it's a bit of a strange subject. What I mean is you can absolutely push the iPad Pro and as you can see here, it can cope with a lot. 
This is the 8 gig version and in this 18 months, there wasn't a single occasion when I thought, I need this 16 gig, you know? I did fall for that trap on the M1 iPad Pro and I shared a lot about that in this video over here. But for my workflow, even when I use Final Cut Pro for some small video editing, the 8 gig is absolutely fine. You know, I don't do a lot with it. To give you a feel for what that means and bring it to life a little bit, you can have 25 layers of 8K canvases in Procreate with 8 gig of RAM, right? So that's insane. Not many artists will go to an 8K canvas. You know, it's crazy to, to, to draw on that. But that number goes up to 112 layers if you're using just 4K canvases, which again, is still quite a big canvas. One of my viewers last year shared this with me, which is quite useful. He does cartoon animations and he really pushes the iPad Pro. And in that use case, I would definitely say it's warranted to go for the 16 gig version. But to give you an idea of his workflow, he was working on projects that can go up to like 70 gig in size, like that's a lot, right? With 20 layers in Calipeg, which is an animation software with frame by frame animations. You know, he also uses Procreate, Rough Animator, Affinity Designer, LumaFusion, and those apps take up to 90% of his iPad time. So, you know, he's really busy, but he was telling me that Procreate and Calipeg were the only apps that have this large project where he felt like, you know, he was really reaching the limits of the iPad Pro. Procreate is a very well-optimized app for the iPad though. You know, it's, it's almost like it was made by Apple. It can really cope with a lot without any issues. For me, and probably for most people, the only time you're gonna really notice the processor, the memory, and the media engine on the M2 iPad Pro being busy at work is when you're doing lots of things in batch, like importing or exporting lots of maybe raw photos in Lightroom and videos, or even animations. But other than those scenarios, you're really not gonna see it breaking a sweat. Of course, the new iPad Pro will be even more powerful, and I can just see Apple saying it's gonna be 40% faster than the previous one, but in my experience, unless you're doing something crazy like my viewer here, that gaining performance over the previous model that Apple promises with every launch, or even the previous two models now, will be measured in seconds rather than minutes. Apple will say, right, 40%, 30% faster. But what that really means is 15 seconds, 20 seconds, 30 seconds faster to do an activity that you only do maybe once every two days. So really think hard about budget versus the benefit you're gonna get. You know, have a look at the apps that you use the most. Look at the developers and see what they're doing about the app. You know, can the app even use that, all that memory? But those things have to go well together. Having said all that, I mustn't ignore the fact that if it makes you happy to get the latest and greatest, who am I or anyone here on YouTube to tell you how to spend your money, right? If it makes you happy, go for it. So I think in general, Keep an eye on the prices of the M2 iPad Pro. Make sure you check the refurbished options as well. Amazon will have some options too. And of course, don't ignore the iPad Air or even the Samsung Galaxy Tab models. Because if you're on a budget, you might be a student, right? And you might think, well, do I need the iPad Pro? Or perhaps you're not even using all these Pro apps anyway. You just need some note taking and some content watching later in the day. There's some pretty awesome options out there. I discussed some of those options in this video over here, and there's a bunch of comparisons I did as well on this playlist over here. And I hope to see you soon. Bye.